She must have some kind of disease. Stars, room, spinning, light, dimming. What should we do? I don't know yet, but we should work very fast. I think we should run some blood work and test on her. And I'm supposed to be the doctor. Very good then. <coughs> I can see the light. This disease is unknown. We should find out what it is. We need to create a new drug. Uh, <laughs> we have to create a new drug to fight it. And how do we do that? We must find which protein is being blocked. normal protein and you see how they fit together and they'll bond. And right now there is a toxin blocking the protein and getting the correct drug it needs. We must run her blood through the computer. Here it's found in the amino acid chain, and it is the protein we need. It seems that the program we have created has found these amino acids to create a protein that we will need to create the new drug to cure her. <coughs> uh, the first amino acid is uh, alanine. The second amino acid is methionine. The third amino acid is asparagine. The fourth one is glutamic acid, and the fifth one is arginine. I'll make the medicine as fast as I can. Here, take this. I'm cured! Knox Perry, Mississippi. I attend Knox Perry, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. My name is Amberly Dixon. I'm from Mex County, Tennessee, and I go to Mex County High School. My name is Jason Bolton. I'm from Elbert County uh, of Georgia, and I attend Elbert County High School. Mm -hmm. And we would like to give a special thanks to ARC, ORAU, the resident teachers, who for me was Lynette and Pat, and for them was Cole and Billy. And we'd also like to thank Marilyn Randolph and Martha Hammond for making this possible for us. And thank the people at ORML. If we can get our mentor to stand up, please. We would like to thank Mr. Pollen for his work with us, for definitely having patient patience with us. It must have been hard, but thank you. Thank you.
seeing from space, uh, which is satellite imagery and aerial photography. Okay. Hello, do you all know why I called you here today? No. no. Not a clue. You do this all the time, and the meeting is over just like that. This isn't one of those, is it? No, not this time. I just have to have an annual meeting, and it's really boring, but deal with it, because I'm your boss, that's my job. <laughs> Anyways, a rather urgent matter has come to my attention. Oh, what's wrong? You're not dying, are you? No, no, no. Here's the deal. I've called you all together here because you are my best agents, and you have very unique skills. So, basically, we're going on a mission, right? Correct. <laughs> Big giveaway. <laughs> So, what are we doing then? Oh wait, can we make this from 10 to 4? I'm very busy this evening. Oh really? Well, it looks like you'll be even busier. Here, let me fill you in. There happens to be a huge radiation leak from the Bellagio Hotel and that's in Las Vegas. You were to find out how much of it has spread since 1984. Consider it done. Okay, seriously, why is there radiation there in the first place? You just poof out of the sky. All right, guys, I'm here. Sorry, yeah, what I missed. Such a goon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a top secret mission, and it's highly classified. In 1984, we had set up an experimental reactor underneath the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas. However, recently, we have discovered that it's been malfunctioning. Like I said before, you need to find out the extent of the radioactive poisoning on humans since the installment. So, how exactly are we going to go about doing this? You know, since we're these such unique agents. Yeah, very unique. I'm going to have to allocate a specific range of years that we need to analyze to each one of you. Okay. Sounds good. Alright. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Anna, you're going to have 1996 and 1999. Yuri, uh, 1996-1999. James, you're going to have 1977 and 1982. Yuri, you get 2000 and 2003. And Bella, you can have 1985 and 1988. Sounds good. Okay, and I guess I'll take the last four years. All right, Doc, so when you say analyze, what exactly do you mean by that? Okay, basically you're going to have to look at the changes in the area to find out how the radiation has spread. You must analyze your photography and distinguish between urban and non-urban areas using your photography software. Here, let me show you. Okay, so now this is the software that I'm using. I am going to look at Las Vegas and switch back and forth between the years to see the differences in the area. Okay, so I see an area right here that looks pretty uh, interesting. So I'm going to zoom in on it. I'm going to see the changes. I see that this area has changed quite a bit. So now I want to outline that with the polygon tool. So I will select the layer, draw a polygon to show the area that has changed. So I place a vertex with the clicker, and I will outline the polygon. So I'm currently doing that, and placing the vertex. So. Now when you guys uh, outline the polygon, this, the software will ask you, uh, after you're done, what exactly it wants you to do. Well, uh, since this is a vacant lot, as you can see here, uh, you will have to say that it has turned from a vacant lot to a commercial or commercial uh, building or zone. So that's commercial. And you just click OK. Now you will continue to do the rest of Las Vegas in this manner. OK? All right, we got this. Oh, yeah. The next, next day. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Reini, I finished the work you asked me for. Here's what I did. All right, as you can see on the right side of the screen, the areas are mostly residential. It's changing from residential again to residential. And then on the left side of the screen, you can see commercial buildings being added onto. And figured out how it works. <laughs> All right, so you can see the commercial buildings extending going bigger, adding on additions, things like that. So I mapped out the changes that way. Hey, this is what I did last night. 
<laughs> okay, with my section of Las Vegas, my main changes were right here on the Vegas Strip. You can see the road going down. And my biggest change was up here actually where the Bellagio Hotel is. And it went from being just the plain grassland kind of tree filled area to being full of hotels and commercial buildings. That was very good, guys. I finished my portion too. Okay. Here's what I did. Basically, I had part of an airport strip and uh, a pretty significant difference was that there was a terminal here that wasn't there before. Um, some vacant lots turned into commercial districts and some homes were also created out of vacant lots. All right, uh, check out what I worked on. Now on my project, I had your other half of the airstrip, so that grew uh, a lot uh, toward the north. And I also worked on some rural areas towards the east. And over here on the west side of Vegas, I worked on some commercial buildings mostly. Okay, Dr. Greeny, I did my part too. On my area, <laughs> On my area, some of the resident buildings changed into commercial buildings, and some of the roads became concrete roads. In some areas, it turned from vacant lands into commercial building landscape. With this image, we compiled all of our polygons together, and here's the whole picture of Las Vegas with the changes from 1984 to 2010. <laughs> All right, as you can see, this is the same image, except it's outlining what exactly has changed. The green being what has been demolished or torn down, the blue being what has changed into something else, and the pink being what has been extended onto. So, Doc, did you get the emails we sent you with all the data? Yes, I compiled all of our data into an animation. So it will show the spread of the radiation over time. Here it is. Well, you can't exactly see the years because it's scaled off the screen here, but that is the expansion of the radiation over time. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it is. So, did we do a good job? Yes, I knew you all could do it. You're my best team, and now that you've mapped out the radiation, it will take us one class, step closer to stopping it. We worked on creating a consequence management plan. We created two situations to show how the programs can be used to demonstrate more than one event. The background story for these situations is two rugby players from Knoxville decided to blow up the MetLife Stadium during the Super Bowl because they're tired of being the underdogs in the sports world. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hello, I'm Hannah Alley reporting for Fox News. And I'm here with Fireman Gazer and bomb expert Dr. Cox. Dr. Cox, can you tell us what type of bomb this was? The chemical sensors inside of the stadium have told us that this is a hydrogen cyanide bomb. What are the effects of this bomb? Initially, people will have restlessness and an increased respiratory rate. These are followed by vomiting, convulsions, respiratory failure, unconsciousness, and even death. Do you know what areas were affected? This model here shows the areas affected. The pink represents death possible, the red represents injury possible, and the yellow represents who should be cautious. Thank you, Dr. Cox. Now reporting from the stadium is Farman Gazer. Farman Gazer, what should the people who were affected by the chemicals do? Go to the nearest hospital. But how many hospitals
people are near the area. There are four in the proximity of the stable. <coughs> are here at Fox News. We heard that some congressmen went to this game. Do you know if any of them made it all right? Most of the people in the stadium were seriously injured or killed. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please let us take a moment of silence for the passing of these congressmen. The firemen gave Um, what should the people do? I mean, what do you do to help these people? We tried to control the chaos and keep people calm, and the seriously injured were taken to the nearest hospital. <coughs> Is that a mushroom cloud? Yes, it is. Hello, welcome to a special news report here at Fox News. I'm Hannah Alley, and beside me I have Officer Brady and the bomb expert Dr. Cox. Dr. Cox, a nuclear explosion has just went gone, has gone off, sorry, gone off near the stadium. Do you know where it went off at? Yes, this model here shows the effects. The red represents severe damage, the yellow represents moderate damage, and the blue represents light damage. What should everyone do now? They need to find shelter. If they stay inside, they can avoid the radiation. But Dr. Cox, how far will the radiation spread and the fallout? This model here shows the radiation after about one hour. Officer Brown, do you have anything to tell the people in the affected area? Yes. They should stay inside for 24 hours. We will not be able to evacuate anyone until the radiation goes away. Until then, do as Dr. Cox says and go inside as soon as possible. Dr. Cox, what will happen to the people if they do not find shelter? After about two hours, they start getting nauseous and they start vomiting. And then this is later followed by organ damage. Officer Brady, is there anything that you'd like to add? Yes. I want the people to know that as bad as this looks, we can make it through it. Mer <laughs> Good night, everybody. We use two programs to create these models, HBAC and Delphic. HBAC stands for Hazardous Prediction Assessment Capability. It originated at ORNL and is used for planning, post-event analysis, and emergency response for any crisis. Delphic stands for Defense Land Fallout <coughs> Interpretive Code. It calculates the radiation fallout, the decay of the radiation, and the exposure rate. We would like to say a big, huge thank you to everyone from ARC, ORNL, ORAU, and to our mentors, Ron Lee and James Black. Would they stand up if they are here? Water and the cell on the inside. 
Um, polymers are made up of individual molecules called monomers. Monomers, in this case, are made up of carbon and hydrogen. Each of us on the stage is a monomer, and we turn hands, and we become a polymer. Uh, the polymer we worked with was positively charged. Uh, this is a lot. Uh, this charge allows us to yeah, attract interactions to occur between the polymer and the surfactant, and it allows it to become a complex. <clears throat> Simulation is done using the code lamps on the same supercomputer. <clears throat> the initial files compose of a thousand randomly positioned surfactants and a long polymer chain of a thousand monomers. The interaction between each molecule and a certain cutoff distance are simulated using the code. The forces between each molecule can be calculated using the following equations. The strongest of the forces, electrostatic, is the force between charged particles. Leonard Jones potential is the force between neutral atoms and theme is the force within the bonds of the polymer that hold it together. Newton's second law can be solved for acceleration, which can be inputted into this equation in order to find the position of each molecule after time t. The position of each molecule is an output of its three-dimensional coordinates. These are the results of the computer simulation of the polymer surfactant complex. The yellow and purple are the surfactants that form the micelles, and the blue chains are the polymers. The points are the counter ions of the solution. In each of the computer simulations, the polymer has different charges. This one had a 100 initial charge on the polymer chain. This had 200 initial charges on the polymer chain. 300, 400, and 500. In conclusion, as the charges on the polymer increased, the attraction between the surfactants and the polymers increased. The results of this research can be used to better understand the interactions of the polymer surfactant complexes. This can be used to better manufacture cleaning products such as shampoos like Head and Shoulders and detergents like Tide. It can also be used to better understand DNA structure. We want to say thank you to our mentors, <coughs> Mona Joy Kusami and Bobby Sumter, and thank you to our ARC representative, Jeff Swartz, ORNL, Martha Hammond, and the, and the ORA staff. systems and engineering group. Well, what is the importance of robots? What are they used for? Well, they're used to make our, our everyday lives easier on us. The first robots <coughs> that were created were used to, uh, to help us um, protect ourselves from radioactive materials. Well, I'm Sophia, I'm from West Virginia. Hello, uh, I'm Justin Ward from Oakland, Mississippi. Ian Garpy from Holly, Pennsylvania. I'm Caleb Novko from Lawrence, New York. I'm Eric McCarty and I'm from Georgia. I'm Natasha Davis from Austin, Ohio. I'm Levi Johnson from Cumberland, Maryland. And I'm Michaela Barker from Boonsville, Maryland. I'm Ashlyn Stackhouse from North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Well, the first robot we got our hands on was the Bobot. It had um, servo motors that were powered by AA batteries. It had a breadboard also that we uh, that we put um, materials on it to uh, power the machine. There was a USB core there that we attached to a laptop that had a program that we used to to program to to program the robot to be able to do specific things as in follow a track 
or move away from objects if it came close. Uh, one of the first things we encounter when dealing with the boat like is installing LED lighting or lighting in diodes. Um, the lighting, uh, the lighting in diodes, we installed the grid board and ooh, they have cathodes which are positive and longer in length and anodes which are negative and are shorter in length. And when you plug the cathode into a positive slot and then the anode into a negative slot, you cause the LEDs to function and you can program them to do whatever you want them to do. Programming. What is programming? Programming is a planned series of future events or performances. So you're practically telling the robot what to do. You have do loops, if not statements, durations, and exact numbers that you have to put into the program to do it exactly what it needs to do. That's all it's that. Programming with the robot was fun and all, but without sensors it became very frustrating. Every detail of the robot's course had to be programmed. Trying to get the robot to follow a perfect square course turned into a huge game of trial and error. The servo motors require coding to move the wheels at certain speeds for a certain amount of time. If there's an error in the beginning of the program run, it will snowball throughout the run, by the end it will be completely off course. I know firsthand, I spent a long time programming and reprogramming until it was perfect. This is why the sensors are important and valuable tools. From the robot, we advanced to a larger robot in which we had to build from scratch. Um, we began to build it starting with the wheels, in which we had problems with because the track wheel or the wheel gear would pop out of place, and thanks to our facilitators, Ken, uh, Ken Swain and Carl Millett, the problem was resolved. <sighs> Sorry, I'm a little stage right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and after we got the wheels fixed and all that set up, we were able to start working on the body. From the body, we began to program, or we began to put on our hardware, our wires, and then from there, we were able to program it. After assembling our new robot, we were given the task to program it to run this course. We used line following sensors with infrared lights that were used to detect the black line, which was electric tape. We were able to program our robot to go forwards, backwards, and be turned based on feedback that was given from these sensors. Our first test runs were rather slow, but we were able to make adjustments to the programming and the speed and the turns to make it more efficient. Ping sensor is an ultrasonic sender and receiver that will determine distance with sending impulses of a certain frequency to determine distance. When the sensor would report that an object was near, the robot would divert itself away from it. Running the course we made for the track robot was a much more pleasant experience. We had the robot equipped with a tri-infrared sensor board that was able to differentiate between the black tape and the white paper of our course. The sensors created eight conditions, each of which require a sub-program. For example, ball three, or just the center sensor, red black, the robot's program would be redirected to a sub-program. The sub-program would command it to go forward upon those conditions. This made running course much faster than we had than when we had to program everything, such as the, the robot. With some fine tuning, we managed to increase our efficiency on the course and cut several seconds off our times. My team's robot made the best time of one minute and a half second, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> Another function that we added to the robots was infrared sensors. We wired onto the robot LED lights, which emit pulses of infrared light. Connected next to the LEDs were two infrared detectors, which would detect any IR light that was reflected back. The program, 
robot is programmed to detect the infrared pulses from different ranges. Therefore, it can tell the distance of an object. With it being able to tell the distance, we can then tell it what to do at different distances. If the robot is too far away from an object, it can speed up. If it is too close, it can slow down. If it, the object is too far to the right or left, it can turn in either direction. That's how we program the robot to follow another object. The high bay is the area where the large expensive robots are stored. The power manipulator doesn't need as many controls as an Andros robot made by drone tech. The Andros has a controller with a lot of buttons to control every single joint we moved. Also, the high bay was a, there was a chair that we were able to move around, and the last thing we were able to play around with was the wall manipulators that had blocks, and we had to blind holes, which was very difficult. Finally, we want to give thank you to our facilitators, Mr. Carl Millett and Mr. Ken Swain, our mentor mentors, Manu Varma, Adam Carroll, Adam Aaron. Other thanks go to Ms. Martha Hammond and Marilyn Randolph at ARAU for all the support they gave us, for Mr. Jeffrey Schwartz and everyone else at ARC, and especially to ORNL for the use of their facilities and making this a fantastic two weeks here in Oak Ridge. Georgia. I go to Murray High. I am Brandy Tarby. I go to Baltimore, New York, at Baltimore Richard Central High School. Good morning. I'm Jared Walker, and I attend. I'm from Oklahoma, Mississippi, where I attend Oklahoma High School. I'm David Rush, and I'm from Tuskegee, Alabama, and I go to Booker T. Washington High School. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am CNN reporter Brian Stanley from Jasper, Georgia. Today, we are called into Oak Ridge National Laboratories in Oak Ridge, Tennessee to meet with the famous lignin doctor, Brandy Charmy. From Baltimore, New York. Covering the presentation of the lifetime are prime reporters Jalen Walker from Oklahoma, Mississippi, and Ebony Rice from Tuskegee, Alabama. I have an undeniable feeling that this is going to be extremely enlightening. Or at least I hope so. Let's see what they have to say. In the rush, case report, for all CCTV, and remember Okay. Doctor, linen or what is it? Lignin. Oh, this is G. Okay, okay. What is it? What is it? Well, lignin is a very, very, very complex polymer as shown here. Why should we even care about it? Well, first off, lignin acts as a glue between cellulose and hemicellulose, and, and naturally produced in high amounts of trees and other plants. We hypothesize that the purity of lignin can actually be measured by its moisture content. Next question. Jalen Walker, first class journalist for Fox News. Ha! <laughs> I'm ignoring that. <laughs> Doctor, what did you find me? Oh, excuse me, sir. I was a page. Excuse me, and by the way, I do have questions too. It's not always about you CCTV people. Watch your tone, Fox News. Calm down, calm down, both of you. Yes, yes doctor. <laughs> to answer your question, Doctor, what is lignin? Lignin is a very complex polymer. Lignin acts as a glue between cellulose and hemicellulose. It always depends um, on what the, what the origin of the lignin would be from, and then it will vary in texture, color, and strength. I've heard reports that say lignin is very difficult to work with. Would you say that lignin is worth the house that it costs? Honestly, no. My man, lignin, it's only worth about three cents per pound. And your question is rush. Thank you. Well, people and I would like to know what paper mills do. What do paper mills do with the lignin when they make the paper? Well, first off, they strip it into yeah, they strip it. They strip the tree material with sodium hydroxide and are usually a waste product. 
and it's most commonly burned with wood pellets. However, it is occasionally used as synthetic vanilla. Back to you. We're still on. Of course, it's still my turn. This question has been on my mind for the longest. Why do you have pictures of hair in your presentation? That's not hair. That is carbon fiber that's spun that will hopefully be lived in the near future. Really? It doesn't look like it. So, who's the guy in the pictures? I'm still not finished. Well, sorry. <laughs> I'll get back to you later, Ms. Rush. Fine. I need to answer this question first. Now, that is my mentor, Dr. Ahmed Nascar. <laughs> and his work will hopefully bring, up, bring about a success much sooner than we previously expected. Thank you. Now, Ms. Rush, you may answer your, ask your questions. Finally. How do you go from lake on the right to a solid pattern in a little jar? Well, first we use a hot plate to <coughs> evaporate the moisture, but just in case we put it into a vacuum so that it would get out that extra moisture. Hmm. How do you make the powder until the fibers are showed us? When the powder is under extreme heat and pressure, it's actually, it turns into a lightweight paste that we can pull and stretch into a carbon fibers. The purity could also affect how easily the fibers could be spun. It really smells like bird form. Now I'm finished box news. It's about time. Watch it. Was your initial hypothesis correct, or did you find that it's beyond your reach? It's still work in progress. However, it seems to be progressing very well. In the future, we can make nearly anything from carbon fiber from Lehman. From cars, to planes, to violins, to stormtroopers. <laughs> and Doctor, what are your other goals, if any, for the future? I expect carbon fiber to be a much cheaper than once it's made from Lehman. Because right about now, it's about $5 a pound. Um, it'll allow everyone to purchase its creations with much more ease. That's all the time I have for today, folks. I feel like so I spent a whole semester in school. But I still have more. Don't you see all the paper I have? So, the doctor sure knows what she's talking about. If we're lucky, we'll have more information in the upcoming years. This stuff may just make a big. I'm looking forward to owning my own carbon fiber storm trooper soon. Sorry. Uh, the voices in my ear have informed me that we need to thank our sponsors, ORU, ORNL, and the ARC program. Till next time, this is CNN reporter Brian Stanley signing off. Have a lovely day. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kayla Osborne. I'm from Ash County, North Carolina. I attend Ash County High School. <coughs> Hello, my name is Holden Ledin. I'm from Blue Ridge, Georgia. My name is Amanda Flynn, and I'm from Ryder, Virginia. My name is Eli Davis, and I'm from Wilson, Ohio. My name is Julia Edwards, and I'm from Boots, Maryland. I'm Bryce Bowen, from Yankee, South Carolina. My name is Kelsey Anderson, and I'm from Yarnsville, Pennsylvania. I'm David Mullins, and I'm from Ledger County, Hello, my name is Shane Woodland, and I'm from Sarasville, Ohio. We would just like to say thank you to our mentor, Bobby Witten, our facilitator, Jerry Sherrod, our assistants, Tommy Harden, and Alex Polka. Uh, ARC, RNL, RAU, and everybody else that made it possible for us to learn about and build a super video.
All right, everyone. We have to do something about our junky Cray EL98 computer. It's just taking way too long to get anything done. I now call this board meeting in order. Other companies are doing it in a quarter of the time that we are. I agree. We definitely need to come up with a new form of technology that will do all of this for us in a fraction of the time. It's just taking too long waiting on our computer to execute each command line. There has to be a faster solution. Well, what doctor are we looking for? What do we need? Well, I heard another company talking about how they increase their RAM or something. How are RAMs going to make a computer faster? Not RAMs. RAM. And the difference is? RAM stands for Random Access Memory. It's temporary data storage. And that means? RAM allows you to access stored data at any given time. Upgrading will allow you to run your everyday operations faster. Well, that's pretty amazing and all, but how do we upgrade? We just need to network a few computers together and make them work as one system. Well, I got an idea. I think the best way to explain it would be in the form of song. It's <laughs> <laughs> my lovely assistant here. I don't have a good memory. So this supercomputer education If my binary ain't in your school's library Then you got some, got some more what we want to carry I see nothing like a backdoor to start off the day Pay a wolf class, we better check the cache 22 nanometer architecture Doors like crashes in Papa's lectures <laughs> It's this cluster of Okay, but how does this improve our computational power? The physical components or hardware are what gives the computer the processing power to compute complex functions. So what you're saying is, if we upgrade these components in our supercomputer, we can increase performance and thus be able to compete in the supercomputing market and earn more fine coupons? Good stuff, everyone. Let's keep the ball rolling. <laughs> Not only is the hardware important, but also the software. If we upgrade the operating system, it will run more efficiently. Well, what other improvements can we make? And how can we all stay connected? Well, Kelsey, I'm glad you asked. We can ping. What is ping? It allows you to test connections with other computers working on the same network. Well, that about sums it up. <laughs> Let's, Let's make a supercomputer. <laughs> Now let's build a supercomputer. Da 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 da. Hey! <laughs> Did I say you guys were joining me? A supercomputer is a high performance machine that is able to process at incredibly high speeds. They are capable of running various applications such as calculations, simulations, and 3D graphics in parallel to solve problems in various fields. Knowing what a supercomputer was, our group began working to set up the Beowulf cluster to mimic the actions of an actual supercomputer. We were also given the task of discovering in what year our supercomputer would have been the fastest, and unanimously decided that it would have been the fastest computer in 1998 due to the vast technological advancements of the late 20th century. We used Ethernet cables. To, we used Ethernet cables to create a network. So we made our own. Here's mine. Uh, let's see. We needed a category five or a category six, five or six or seven cables. A pair of crimpers, uh, cable cutters, scissors, RJ45 plugs, and the cable tester. We decided the length of the cable and cut it a little bit longer than that. Then we removed one to two inches of the cable jacket. 
making sure not to cut the wires. Then I'm twisting the wires and straightening them in order. And the order is the wire map right there. And then we cut the wires to fit into one of these small RJ45 plugs. They must be even, otherwise you don't get a good connection. Then we inserted the wires simultaneously in the, making sure that they're still in the same order on the map. And then we check the order, and then we crimped using the crimpers. And then we checked the cable with the cable tester. Part of making our supercomputer was networking. Networking is when two or more computers are linked together so they can communicate, share data, and exchange information. They are created with the purpose of exchanging data and are beneficial in businesses, organizations, and medicine. They have many configurations, including star, bus, and wireless, with wireless being a kind of bus. For our supercomputer, we had a star configuration between one central switch and nine laptops. Once we had everything we needed to build our supercomputer, we began construction. We networked the computers together using Ethernet cable, and then we modified the IP addresses so that the system was, would communicate properly with each other. We tested the connections using some of the networking skills and command lines that we were taught. And then once we determined that all the computers were running properly in sync, we ran a test. This test uses complex matrixy multiplication to figure out how fast our computer actually runs. And the test determined that our computer runs at 47 gigaflops. We had originally assumed that our computer would have been fastest in 1998, but after further research in the 1990s, we came to the conclusion that it wouldn't have been in 1998 that our computer was fastest, but in 1991. We thank you for your time. On a side note, if anybody wants the link to this website, come find me. I have it. <laughs> I just can't believe it. Where are they? Where in the world? No, it's time for them to be here. They're, they haven't sent me a text message and they haven't sent me or called me. Where have you been? I had a car trouble. I had to walk last hour to get here. Am I late? Yeah, you're late. Why, are you, why did you have to walk? You know that new car I bought last month I was pretty excited about? That new Chevy Bolt? Well, I had to work late last night. Didn't get home till really late. We plugged it in at 3 o'clock this morning, and then I had to be back to work at 7. I guess it just didn't charge. Why didn't you call me? Don't text me. Well, the phone was pretty darn hot this morning. I opened it up. I had no charge. My battery died, I guess. Hey, did I miss it? No. <laughs> You're late, too, so what's your problem? Well, I was waiting until the last minute to get my laptop charged up, and it takes forever. So did you bring it? I brought it, but I'm not sure if it's going to last in the presentation. I wish they would do something to improve batteries. All our problems today seem to relate to issues with batteries, charging slow or losing charge too fast. You know, I was reading the Wall Street Journal this morning, and they, I was noticing there's some research that they're doing at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory on batteries. Yeah, I read something about that, too. They're trying to make batteries from new materials. Something about nanoparticles. Nanoparticles. Uh, they're hoping they'll hold char more charge capacity and they'll charge up a lot faster. Well, that would sure solve a lot of our problems. Uh, I'm Christy Fitzwater. I'm from West Virginia. Jan St. Pierre from New York. And a little waste from Mississippi. is the effects of nanoscale particles on the performance of lithium nickel tube oxide batteries. 
We'd like to thank everyone at ORNL, ARC, and ORU. We'd like to thank Franz Corinthium for all his help. Uh, Jim Davis for his guidance on our project. And Alex Butler for all her help. It's me working in the left. <coughs> me working in the left. <laughs> and me in the left. <laughs> <laughs> These are our two mentors. And what we did is basically made a surface for anode um, half cells. We made nickel hydroxide, and what was different is we used the reverse mycel process where you take two micelles and put the two reactants inside each one so that when they come together you have a mini reaction. And that mini reaction forms small nanoparticles. This is showing the different processes that occurred in the lab. <coughs> You can see the color change as they were added together. Centrifuge, separated particles. The annealing process converts nickel hydroxide to nickel oxide at extremely high temperatures. Note the color change. Uh, we were successful in creating nanoparticles. We first formed iron hydroxide nanoparticles. However, they were so small that we couldn't get them out of solution. So we then formed nanoparticles <coughs> from nickel to oxide. There was a lot of time weight involved in this process. Casting is like spraying pretty in a t-shirt. You spread the slurry on the floor. just a stack of anode and cathode. We did um, battery performance testing, and our results were a little bit on the rough side, but overall, it showed that the nanoscale, like uh, nickel oxide, nickel two oxide, had a better charge capacity compared to the macro scale nickel two oxide. We would like to thank our mentors and teachers. And there was music that went along with all of this. <laughs>
Mezzadonna and I'm a multi-family uh, home auditor. Hi Annette, I'm Gina. We spoke last month on the phone about my building that I own in Florida. It is six units, one story building, and each unit has its own heating and cooling system. I'm hoping that you can look at ways to help me upgrade because it's very outdated and not very energy efficient. Since our last meeting, what I did is I sent a team over to your house wall to collect data. What we did is we took dimensions from your building, we took um, parameters including insulation, window type, lighting, and, and the um, system on the heating and cooling. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to audit my building. Now that you have the results, is there any way I can lower my energy bills? I am so glad that you mentioned that. What the program suggests, according to Florida's climate, is that you change your windows from double, single pane to double pane with solar low heat glass. Um, the increase the amount of insulation in your wall cavity. Um, use more efficient lighting. Upgrade your heating and cooling system. And you can also change your roof shingles from a lighter color to a from a darker color to a lighter color for the day of more reflective properties. With these changes, you can have approximately 54% decrease in energy usage. Once we put the monthly utility bills in, then we can come up with a dollar value of savings. Oh wow, 54% decrease? That's amazing. I am so glad I took the time to have you audit my building. But I have one other concern. I have three other buildings in different climate zones. I have one that's much colder in upstate New York, a second uh, building in Chicago, and my third building is in West Virginia. Can you use Multi to audit these product properties as well? Sure, but the um, upgrades were according to the Florida climate, but if we did the identical upgrades in New York, which is much colder, there would be only a 37% decrease in energy usage. And in Chicago, it would be 39%. And in West Virginia, it would be 43%. Oh, so what you're saying is that not all upgrades will work in the same climates, or in different climates. As a homeowner, I need to research the building materials and figure out which upgrades are suitable for certain climate zones. You really catch on quickly. I am so impressed with you. Thank you for using the multi-computer simulation program, and good luck with your upgrades. Well, thank you. You're welcome. All right, we'd also like to give a special thank you to Oak Ridge National Laboratory, ORAU, ARC, and especially to many for working with us and having patience with us. Anything to it. See, told you. No worries. 
things. It's all in the material, perfectly constructed and engineered with no better. Just like in the story of the three little pigs, in which the third pig built his home with layers and layers of brick, scientists use a similar method to create products called additive manufacturing. By utilizing this process, virtually any three-dimensional solid can be created. This method of continuously layering and melting metallic powder to form a solid is incredibly detailed and produces amazing results. Additive manufacturing is used in the aviation, automotive, and medical fields. The root word of residual is residue. So think about wiping a wet paper towel across a flat surface and leaving behind a streak. This is how residual stress works. Residual stress is any remaining stress acting on a material once a force has been applied and then removed. The big bad hole blowing on the houses represents a force being applied to a material. Some materials hold up well under stress, while others, of course, do not. The straw, the sticks, and the brick represent three different materials that houses can be made of. The materials we studied in the lab were Inconel 625 and 718. They are both nickel alloys, but the elements making up their composition cause their properties to be different. The orientation of the straw, sticks, and bricks used to build the homes demonstrates texture. In our study, the grain structures of different particles varied can affect the strength of the structure. Throughout our time at the Oak Ridge National Lab, we used an x-ray machine like this one. Actually, this is the one we used. And this machine has a diffractometer, which allows us to look at a metallic sample by moving the sample in various angles. An x-ray tube emits an x-ray beam at the sample, then a detector analyzes those diffracted x-ray beams. This information is then transmitted to a computer and a report is created using software programs that tell us information about peaks in our experiments. As you can see in this next slide, the location of these peaks tells us phase, comparing intensity between the powder and solid, texture, and an individual shift in each of those peaks tell us residual stress. These are actual results from our time in the lab. In order to look more closely at the residual stress, we chose the peak at approximately 119 degrees to theta. The X-ray diffractometer relates information to a computer program that provides numerical and graph data. The numerical data corresponds to graph peaks that help us determine composition, residual stress, um, and texture of the material. In the diagram on the left, we're looking at a shift in one of the peaks. The diagram on the right of the screen interprets the information we're able to get from the graph peaks. You'll name the diagram on the right different angles at which we've collected the X-ray data. A computer program calculates the positive and negative numerical values that you see displayed in the table. The negative values tell us, tell us that the stress in the material is impressive, and the positive values tell us that the stress is tensile. The orientation of the sample helps us determine texture, but it also helps us understand the strength of the material in regards to the direction of the stress versus the orientation of the structure in the build of the material. We compared both metal powder and metal solid samples of Inconel 625 and 718. An analysis of the metal powder, which had not yet undergone the manufacturing process, gave us an idea of what our data should look like in the stress-free state. Analysis of the metal solids, which had been built from the powder and had undergone the manufacturing process, gave us data in the stress states. This data is able to tell us which of these materials would be most suitable for certain products. So of course we could not have been so successful in the laboratory without the help of many people. So we want to take a moment to thank everybody at ORNL, ORU, ARC, and a special thanks to Jeffrey Schwartz, <coughs> Martha Hannum, Tom Watkins, and of course our fearless leaders, Lindsay Colbus and Burrow Cabin. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Shively. I'm from Blue Ridge, Georgia. I teach at Fannin County High School. I'm Susan Aycock, and I teach at Oklahoma High School in Mississippi. I'm Katie Hittinger. I 
teach at Chapman High School in Inman, South Carolina. Our mentors were Michael Smith and Dr. Seppo Pintella. Okay, we'd like to say a special thank you before we get started to ORU, ARC, and ORNL. And especially our mentors, they took a lot of time to explain a lot of in-depth physics to us in two short weeks. So we appreciate all their time and patience with us. And to the awesome student interns that came in and helped us and explain to us all of Okay, so we had really two parts of our uh, stint here at Oak Ridge. Part one is the cosmic explosions with Michael Smith. And then part two was in fundamental neutron physics with uh, Seppo Pantilla. Okay, so we studied stellar explosions, and I guess a good way to start out is to talk about the star cycle. So you can have really two types of stars here. You have the average star. I got a laser pointer. Mm -hmm. Right here, which is kind of like our star, and then it grows into a red giant, then it goes into a gas, and then it turns into a white dwarf. Got it? You can also have a really big star, which can grow into a red supergiant, supernova explosion, and it can go into a black hole or a neutron star. Here's another kind of example of how the star cycle works. All right, so this is a pretty cool picture giving you an idea of what uh, a nova and a supernova explosion actually is. So this is a supernova right here, but what we really studied was something called a nova. And this is kind of a picture over about five months. And you have to remember, every element in our bodies besides hydrogen and helium came from explosions like this. So the carbon in our bodies, calcium in our bones, oxygen that we breathe, all came from this stuff right here. I got a clip here showing you, hopefully it works, showing you kind of what happens in a uh, little explosion. Okay, so this is a NOVA kind of explosion. It happens in a binary kind of solar system. I'm thinking you guys don't know that stars can be kind of in pairs. Well, this is a white dwarf here. It kind of took all the hydrogen from one star and then when it accumulated all that hydrogen, it exploded in one big burst. And this happens all the time in the universe, like once every second. Because this universe is so big, we don't really see it that often. Okay, so how do we study exploding stars? And it's really kind of a detailed, complex process. Well, first, we have, um, yeah, hold on. Telescopes can only measure something so far. So we can only peek into the universe so far. And the universe, as you know, is just huge, expansive, massive. So we have to come up with different ways to study these, study these explosions. Important radionuclei, nucleides, right, can be detected in satellites by space. Here's a satellite here, so it can detect certain radioisotopes, if you want to think of that. So our team really focused on three real important nucleotides. Radioisotopes, F18, N22, and aluminum 26. We learned about um, NOVAs and the science behind NOVAs and our head began to swell. And then we started speaking Greek. Alphas and betas and gammas, and our heads swelled even bigger. <clears throat> our mentor gave us a nuclide chart, and we were to find these three mysterious isotopes and figure out the reactions that might could possibly make these nuclides. And so each of these little arrows is a, is a nuclide reaction, and we wanted to find out what possible path might eventually end up into one of our three magic nuclides. There's lots of different scenarios for a NOVA explosion, and we had a limited time to explore them. So we decided on one scenario. We decided on a white dwarf with the oxygen um, neon magnesium core, and we decided to look at the the concreted layer, um, the second zone. 
And so we concentrated all of our efforts on this second zone. And each of us picked different nuclide reactions and ran computer simulations. These computer simulations took all of the thermonuclear reactions and all of the parameters, the heat and the time factors, and ran it through. And ran it through seven um, intensity scenarios from 10 to negative 3, clear up to 10 to, to the positive 3, and sometimes we went clear up to the millions. Results of these uh, <coughs> scenarios or computer simulations were graphs. We were hoping to get a graph that came up that showed us that the nuclide that we picked would eventually end up one of the, the isotopes that we wanted to, to get. So this one was one, this was the, the um, fluorine isotope. And this one showed an increase or a possibility that all three isotopes we were looking for would be, would be created. Some of them had really bizarre reactions, and so this indicated further study to figure out why this, this kind of chart would, would uh, occur. But most of our reactions were this straight mill reaction. Our studies were really significant. In three days, the four of us, we added a high school intern, Chloe Sims. And in four days, we made 100 runs, making this the first large-scale survey, survey of sensitivity reactions. And so this has never been done before. And this body of, of uh, information we have is important to science. And we're really proud to be part of it. Um, an exciting feature of this study is that it's open source information. It's posted online at, at um, nucastrodata.org. And so other scientists can participate in the study and add to this body of knowledge. OK, so for our <coughs> second week here, we went up to SNS. And we did some work um, on B mine 13, which is the only new mine at SNS that actually studies the neutron itself. All the other green lines are looking at different materials, different things, but the fundamental neutron group is actually looking at the neutron and the properties of the neutron. So we learned about a bunch of different experiments that they were doing, but we focused on the NPV gamma experiment. And basically what that means is that we are taking a neutron and we are reacting it with a proton, and when you do that, you get a deuteron and a gamma ray is released. And basically what they want to try and do is to determine the correlation between the direction of the gamma ray release and the direction of the neutron spin. This is really important because it helps us better understand the weak interactions um, <coughs> with the standard model of physics. And when we're doing this, we're looking at parity and looking for parity violation. So <coughs> what does all of that mean? Basically, to simplify it as possible, or as easy as possible, we take a neutron, and we set it up in the experiment using a polarizer and have all the spins go in the up direction to start off with, so that we can have a standard <coughs> way of looking at it. Then what we do is we look at the direction of the gamma ray. The gamma ray can either be released up or down, <coughs> we don't really know, but we want to measure that and figure that out. And they want to see how the correlation is. Is it an equal distribution? Is it an unequal distribution? Trying to figure it out. Now, with this, we can't just look at the direction of the neutron spin in the up direction. We actually have to create a mirror image of the experiment and have the neutron in the down direction and then see what the correlation between the up and down directions of the released gamma ray are. And when we do that, we can see if there's asymmetry. And asymmetry with the gamma ray is considered a parity violation, which is really important to the standard model, model of physics and the weak interactions within the nucleus. It seems really, really simple. And the experiment seems like it could be pretty straightforward. It's really not. There's a whole lot of work involved and a whole lot of equipment involved. And this kind of gives you an idea of all the different pieces of this one experiment on B-line 13. And for this experiment, the really important part is the spin flipper. Because we cannot take all of this equipment and flip it upside down to create a mirror image of it. We use the spin flipper to flip the direction of the neutron so that we can run the experiment. And then if you look at this picture, 
this gives you a better idea of just how big this experimental setup is. Okay, that ladder in there is a full-size ladder. The experiment is taller than me. It is huge. And there's all these different pieces of it. And one of the things that we learned about physics is the physicists do not just sit in their office and crunch calculations and crunch numbers, though we did do a little bit of that. We did a lot of math, actually, this week. But you'll notice that a lot of the physicists <coughs> wear dark-colored t-shirts. And that's so that you can't see the dark from all the experiments that are being done, the equipment taken apart. I learned that a physicist is part electrical engineer, part mechanical engineer, part computer scientist, and then occasionally they get to do the physics that they're actually looking for. So there is a lot involved in all of this stuff. Okay, one thing we were able to do that nobody, I don't think, in this room, maybe a couple guys actually did, but we were able to go underneath s and &S and actually see the tunnel. And it was an awesome experience. And so when we were doing this presentation, we had to include this. So here are just some pictures that we went through. Obviously, the tunnel beam would not be on when taking these pictures because we would die. But anyways, we went through the tunnel and we just took these awesome little pictures and I can give you kind of an idea of what we're looking at. There's some different cavities. I think they said there was like 12 cavities within the beam. And so here's a little separation beam. Here's a cryogenic part and here's where the beam is trying to narrow to hit the mercury target. There is kind of an accumulator, almost like a spiral at the beam to add on protons, and this is part of the, this part of the uh, accumulator right here. And here's just another kind of picture of how big the power source is. Okay. Yesterday, we went and saw HIFER. Does anyone know what HIFER stands for? Okay, one person. <laughs> All right, High Flux Isotope Reactor. And again, we went with the graduate students. That's how awesome we are. We were able to go with the graduate students. So we went and saw how transuranium elements actually are created. Anyone know what transuranium elements are? Okay, all right, never mind. So here's the uranium right here. You're gonna put it into the water to create stuff like Berkeley and California and all that kind of heavy, cool metal stuff. And they also have, uh, here's a kind of control center, which I think looks kind of old and odd, but I took a picture of it anyways. And they also have bead studies at the uh, Hyper reactor, kind of like SNS. So, yeah, it was really cool. We definitely lucked out with being in the physics group. It definitely stretched us a lot. And seeing this stuff and getting to work and learn on all of the things that we did over the two weeks was totally awesome. We're all chemistry teachers, so we're science nerd. And Every day was pretty much like we were like a little kid in a thin cane store learning something here, so it was pretty awesome. And then, they <coughs> saved the best for last, but we have something fun for y'all. Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state, and nearly 14 million years ago, expansion started way back in the 